We're already in a recession. We seem to be coming out of it a little bit. We're sort of recovering. The path of recovery that we're going to see going forward is really going to depend more on microbiology than macroeconomics. Hi, I'm Dr. Jed McCosco at academicinfluence.com and Wake Forest University. And today we have a very special guest coming to us from Harvard, Professor Gregory Mankiw. Greg, it's great to have you on today's show. We have a couple of fun questions for you. The first, oh, thank you. It's nice to be with you. Yes, the first, uh, you're welcome. Uh, the, uh, the first question I love to ask is, how did you get interested in economics? And, and where did it happen? Was it when you were in high school or in college? No, for me, it was freshman year of college. I had really no idea what economics was. I started college at Princeton, uh, thinking I'd be a math major or maybe one of the sciences. Uh, but then a friend of mine uh, was taking an economics course, and she was telling me what she was learning, and it seemed more interesting to me than anything I was learning in my courses. So I started reading one of her books and, and thought this was really interesting. And the next semester, my second semester of freshman year, I started taking economics courses, and it was, it was a smooth ride uh, from there on in. Did you go straight into a graduate program or did you do something between college and grad school? Um, I did. I started uh, my PhD at MIT right after I graduated from Princeton. Um, in the middle there, I, I did a few other things, though. I didn't finish the PhD uninterrupted. I went and spent a year uh, and a half, actually, in law school, thinking maybe I'd try a law degree as well. Um, decided not to, so I was a law school dropout. Uh, I also spent a year working at as on the staff of the Council of Economic Advisors in 1982-83. Mm, and what was that like, being on a Council of, of Advisors like that? Oh, it's, it's a fascinating organization. The Council of Economic Advisors is a small group. It's, a, it's got three members that are appointed by the president and a staff of, of 30 or 40. Uh, and their only job is, is to advise the president uh, and give them the best economic advice uh, we can. So I arrived as a relatively junior staffer back in 1982. And then I came back um, in 2003 uh, with a different president who was chairman of the organization. Wow, that's fascinating. So it, obviously a lot happened between those uh, two time points. You finished your degree at MIT and then did you immediately become a professor or what happened next? I immediately became a professor. I got my uh, first uh, job uh, at Harvard uh, as an assistant professor. Uh, I, I had taught a couple courses as an instructor at MIT. Um, but basically, my first you know, full permanent job was as an assistant professor at Harvard, uh, where I got promoted, and it, I've been there ever since. So other than the couple of years that I've gone off to Washington, I mean, I've been a, a professor at Harvard my entire career. That's so fun. Now, when did you then uh, go back? Like, why did you go back to uh, the Council of Economic Advisors and, and be the chairman there? Like, what, what was the process? Well, I've always been a very policy-oriented economist, I'm interested in sort of applied topics. So it was very natural for somebody like me to get a job uh, like that. The way I particularly got the job is I, I knew my predecessor, a guy named Glenn Hubbard, who had worked for George W. Bush's campaign, and he became the first chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors um, when, when George Bush became president. Uh, two years later, Glenn was going to go back to Columbia, uh, where, he, where he's on the faculty, and, and at the time, I believe, was dean of the business school. And he was looking for his successor. And he called me up and said, but I'd be interested. And I went down and interviewed, uh, got the job. Um, and then I spent two years there. Fun. That was fun. Did you bring your whole family down with you? and or did you commute? Well, we, we had a big debate about that. I had three small children at home. And uh, there was a debate whether to dislocate the whole family, move everybody into new schools, or have me fly back and forth. And it was a tough choice. Uh, but we decided that in the end, this people, People here in Boston were happy with the schools they were in, um, and so I wouldn't disrupt their lives, and I'd fly back on weekends. And I did almost every weekend fly back. So basically, my my wife basically became a single parent five days a week, hmm. which is a tough job with three small children. Oh my uh, and uh, then I, I flew in um, on weekends. Yeah, but it all worked out. Your kids have, have grown up, uh, flown the coop, and, and you guys are still in the Boston area. That's true. Still in the Boston area, we're empty nesters. Fortunately, all my kids are relatively close. Um, but now it's just my wife and I at home. Fun. Really fun. Well, going back to uh, working in 1982 in the same, uh, you know, council, um, that was when Reaganomics were a big thing. So um, we just had an interview with Steve Keen, 
who I'm sure you, you've heard of his name and you probably have feelings about him and his uh, sort of renegade economics. He said something interesting about uh, about the Reagan years and said that that uh, this whole this whole sketch that the guy made for Reagan on a napkin about how, you know, that there's this sort of peak and then it comes back down. And if you can lower taxes, you'll actually improve uh, the amount of revenue you get because you know businesses will be growing. You'll get more taxes in the end. And, you know, you followed that sort of Reaganomics. And then, according to Steve Keen, uh, it actually had a totally different effect, but then it ended up stimulating the economy. So I was fascinated about that. What's your take on sort of that Reagan period of time? Yeah, that, that curve you're referring to is referred to as the Laffer curve. That's right. And the Laffer curve is um, not controversial as a matter of economic theory, that tax rates can reach such high levels that cutting them could potentially raise revenue. In fact, I te teach the, the theory in my uh, by textbooks. But very few economists thought that taxes had reached that high levels and that we were actually in the region of the curve where cutting rates would raise revenue. And indeed, they, they didn't. I mean, we ran very big budget deficits during that period. On the other hand, it did stimulate the economy and recovered quite rapidly from a very deep recession um, uh, in 1982. Uh, so, so, I, so I think there are arguments for the tax cuts beyond the Laffer style of arguments. Um, but I don't think many economists at the time really thought that that we were on the wrong side of the Laffer curve. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that Steve Keen would agree with you uh, at that point that, that economists knew that that was all kind of hogwash. Uh, but Reagan bought into it. And then as kind of just a happy side effect, it ended up stimulating the, the economy for other reasons. So and, and I know that uh, Steve Keen has his own thinking about what stimulates an economy. Do you are you familiar with his uh, alternative theories of economics that no, I'm not. I'm not intimately familiar with his views, but I mean, but but this, but it's certainly correct that changes in taxes have both what we call supply side effects, which is what the stuff that Arthur Laffer emphasized, and demand side effects, which is what more Keynesian theories emphasize. And I think the sort of standard textbook treatment is it affects both sides of the economy. Um, and part of what happened in, in in the aftermath of the Reagan tax cuts was an increase in aggregate demand. Just probably needed at the time because um, because we were suffering from a very big recession. I mean, people, students today will make, probably forget this, but 1982 was a very very deep recession at the time. It was the uh, worst recession since um, the Great Depression. So it was really was a, a very depressed period of time, and the tax cuts did help uh, uh, pull us out of that. Hmm. Interesting. Um would you would you say that uh, standard economics, as you refer to it, uh, doesn't talk very much about finance? It talks about supply and demand, but not about uh, the financial ways that money is generated by sovereign nations and things like that. Uh, oh. Is that is that something that's sort of not part of standard economic textbooks? Oh no, I, I think quite the contrary. I think fin financial markets, financial institutions are very much part of um, uh, economics textbooks, the idea of, you know, what does a central bank do? You know, the central bank is the Federal Reserve in the United States or the European Central Bank in, in Europe, Bank of England in England. Um, those sort of financial institutions are very important for understanding uh, the macro economy. Uh, in, in the way I, what we teach it at Harvard is the, the first semester is microeconomics which is sort of specific firms and consumer decision-making and markets, supply and demand. And then you don't really get much into finance. But then the second half, half of the year is macroeconomics. We do talk a lot about financial institutions, uh, including the central bank. And indeed, in recent years, we've probably talked more about financial institutions because the deep recession in 2008 was basically if it was, came on the heels of a financial crisis. And so to really understand that economic downturn, you kind of have to understand how the financial system works. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Do you think we're headed for another deep recession because of COVID? And are there sign, warning signs like there were before the 2008 recession that uh, maybe not this time in the housing market, but maybe in the sort of business sector, there's bad debt and things like that that might lead to a recession? Well, we're, we're already in a recession. I mean, the, the COVID has caused a big increase in unemployment. Um, and the, the, the National Bureau of Economic Research that dates recessions has already said we're in a recession. The unemployment rate reached a, no, a new post-World War II high um, at about 15%. So we, we're, we're already in a recession. 
we seem to be coming out of it a little bit. We're sort of recovering. The path of recovery that we're going to see going forward is really going to depend more on microbiology than macroeconomics, in the sense that it's really going to depend on, are we going to get a vaccine? Are we going to get better therapeutics? Are we going to figure out how to contain this with non-pharmaceutical interventions like masks? Um, I think, so I don't think we can really get back to a normal economy until people feel safe to do normal economic activities. You know, things like the restaurant sector is, 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 has been hit very hard and they probably really won't, can't come back to normal until people feel like they can go into a restaurant and, and be, be close to other people and not feel like they're putting their life at risk. That is for sure. Um, do you track what's going on like in Europe and um, with COVID where it looks like they're having a resurgence, uh, but the cases are not as fatal, things like that? Do you do you monitor that as part well, of I, I do to some degree. I mean, because I, I, I mean, now the connection between medicine and economics is as close as it, as it ever is. Um, so I'm sort of w watching what's going on and how different countries are, are, are dealing with it differently. I actually am somewhat optimistic in, uh, economically in the sense that I think once a vaccine is developed and it'll probably happen in the next six, nine months, then we can start distributing it. And I think the life can start going back to normal. Um, but I think it's, we're in a very difficult time. And as we're all social distancing the, the best we can, we really can't expect economic activity to uh, resume. That's really encouraging. Um, now, just talking a little bit about economics as a field to go into, you know, if, if a young person is thinking about going into economics, uh, you mentioned you sort of thought you might do math. Is math a really critical part of economics or are there parts of economics you can do without like really high level math? Well, I think a person can certainly major in economics without high level math. And economics is a great entry into lots of different fields. So if you want to be, say, a lawyer, um, you know, getting, a, getting an economic undergraduate degree makes a lot of sense because a lot of law is going to be dealing with economic issues. So understanding the economic issues are important. And you can certainly get an undergraduate degree major with that much, much math. I think at Harvard, we require one semester of calculus to, to major in economics. Uh, and when I first arrived at Harvard, we didn't even require that. So you, you, you don't need a lot of math to do basic undergraduate economics. If you want to then go become a PhD economist and become a professional economist, then you really need to, to do a lot of math, in particular applied math, like probability theory, mathematical statistics, differential equations, and so on. Um, so, I, so I think if you want to become a professional economist, yes, you got to take a lot of math. That shouldn't deter someone who wants to major in economics. I should say, by the way, my daughter, who's now in medical school, was an undergraduate econ major. And that may seem very strange, a combination of medicine and economics, but in fact, she's very interested in sort of the public policy associated with, with healthcare. And so that involves both an understanding of medicine and an understanding uh, of economics. That's really cool. Now, in your own research, do you use a lot of differential equation math, that kind of stuff? What, what's the main amount of math you use? I, at times. I mean, a lot, a, a lot of macroeconomics is about studying decision making over time and how the, the evolution of the economy over time. And that uh, will often be described in terms of differential equations. Um, so that, that's a particularly useful um, uh, a branch of mathematics. Well, there's other branches of mathematics that are probably less useful in taking a course in topology. Is not, it may, 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 may train your mind, but it's not going to be the tools you're learning in a topology course are not going to be useful uh, in economics. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So um, for somebody who's just thinking about the different uh, things that you get to do as a PhD in economics, what would you say besides being a professor, if you go all the way to the PhD level, what else is there out there? Sure, there's lots of different opportunities. Um, one can go work in a government agency that's formulating economic policy. So I've spent a couple summers as an intern at the Congressional Budget Office, which is one of my favorite government uh, agencies uh, that basically does economic analysis to try to inform Congress as Congress is debating uh, legislative priorities. So that's a, a sort of a, really a very socially valuable use of economics. Private firms uh, will often hire economists. So a lot of uh, Tech firms like Google and Amazon are going to sort of figure out how to hire economists in order to figure out how to run auctions. And they're doing uh, auctioning off ad space, for example. How to, what's, what's the optimal way to do that? So you see economists playing an important role both in private industry, in the public sector, as well as, of course, academia. Mm -hmm. 
Interesting. Now, recently, the news is that uh, Goldman and Sachs came out saying that if uh, Biden wins the election and the Senate is flipped to, to the Democrats, uh, the economy will improve faster. How do they know that uh, as you know, like economists? And uh, yeah, I'm a little skeptical. I'm, I'm a little skeptical that they, that they do know that. Uh, um, they obviously have a, a set. Of, they have some sort of model model of the economy in mind, and they have s- some guesses as to what the Biden uh, and Trump um, policies will be. I think it's always it's very hard to know both because the models are going to be imperfect. I mean, you don't really know what their policies are going to be. P- politicians take stands during the election. Sometimes they follow through, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they don't follow through for the simple reason they can't get their their uh, p- policies through Congress. So I think it's I think it's uh, I, I, I I take that those projections with a big grain of salt. Okay, Sp- spoken like a true economist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, and just as we finish up here, um, I'm curious. You know, sort of, you've worked with a lot of different administrations. What have you seen that really helps the United States the most and helps sort of just international economic growth the most? Well, I think fundamentally what we need is good institutions, a good policy. We need, we need, we need oh, so the rule of law. We need, we need policymakers who understand what the, what, what, how when policy can improve matters, when things should be both best left to the markets. Um, but ultimately, the policymakers are answering to voters. So I think ultimately what we really need is an electorate that's thoughtful about economic issues. And the best way to make them thoughtful is that more people take economics courses. So I think teaching economics is tremendously important and taking economics courses is tremendously important because it's, it's teaching and training the voters of the future. Well said. What can you share just in this short last little bit of the interview that you think are important points that, that we as the electorate need to understand? Uh, and if, if you can't obviously teach us everything, just tell us what we need to know that we need to look into more as we uh, maybe take a class or, you know, some online MOOC or just, you know, pick up a book on economics. So what, what do we need to be looking at here? I think the big, the big question in economics is when, when do markets work well and when do markets fail? And there's a whole bunch of, there's a large body of theory, much of which can be taught at the, at the introductory level that explains, you know, why did Adam Smith admire markets? Why is this, this is magic of the invisible hand that, that, that somehow decentralized decision making is going to lead to good outcomes. But when does the invisible hand let us down? When do we need government to step in to correct market forces? These market forces are leading us astray. And that, I think, is really one of the big central questions um, of economics. And I can't give you the, the, the simple answer because it's, it, it's a complicated problem. But it's a problem that you, get, you make a lot of headway in in just your first economics course. OK, well, we'll look into that. Thank you so much, Professor Mankiw, for taking some time with us today, helping us understand what an, uh, an economist does and the fun things you get to do. And also what we as, as the people who are not economics professors should be thinking about. So thanks so much. It's been my pleasure.